Nancy Pillay, welcome to The Basis Project. It's really delighting to sit to see you again from mm -hmm. Holland. And you've got a presentation on a particular Egyptian cat goddess. Lion goddess. Oh, lion goddess. Okay, very important. Uh, yeah. A lot of very important coincidences involved here. Synchronicities. Synchronicities, so take it away. Okay. Yes, last year I had a, I had a special experience with the Egyptian goddess Sekhmet in the British Museum. And I gave two lectures about that, in Holland one and in Glastonbury. And I'm doing now a presentation uh, for Miles. And uh, it's called When Sekhmet Becomes Alive. So, in 1992, I went to Egypt for the first time, and I hope to be there in October again. But I was, we were very much into uh, getting into the pyramids and seeing the Sphinx, and uh, we were there for 10 days. But I did not see any Sekhmet statue, it, there was no connection for me then. But in 2010, I entered the British Museum and I saw these four uh, Sekhmet statues and I felt a magnetic attraction but I didn't know what to do with it I, I had no clue I just felt it and I remembered it uh, for all these years but that was it um, then in 2010 we went to Glastonbury and I had a mystical experience in the White Spring. That's, uh, of course, you know, uh, opposite the, the, the Red Spring, the Chalice Well. And uh, I felt a force coming out of the, the tour, coming to me and uh, saying to me, uh, do you remember? And this force was immense, immense. And I was crying and crying. And it, it kind of was life changing for me. Um, uh, and then, because of that, I, uh, I, I wanted to know more about the place and I also wanted to know about mo more about Glastonbury and I got into, really uh, 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 found out that Dion Fortune was a very important medium and occultist and writer. She used to live in Glastonbury and in London and she did a lot of magical work at the bottom of the tour and that's really close to the White Spring. And 2010 was also um, uh, the weird thing that happened after this mystical experience was that uh, time and electricity. We, we drove um, uh, from Glastonbury to Wiltshire wheelchair in a time that was not possible and electricity behaved really weird. So there, there, there was something happening, something happened to me in the White Spring um, and I, uh, if you want to know more about that, you can find it on my website because I wrote several articles about it. And this was the same time uh, in 2010 that we founded Sky High Creations and under that name we organize lectures and conferences in Holland and also in England. Um, in uh, last year, because of this experience, I wanted um, uh, to go to the British Museum. I've had a burnout and I'm more sensitive since ever since I've had that. And I needed to go to the British Museum, but I didn't know why. And um, this is a shop that we always go to, the Atlantis Bookshop. And the owner of the shop, I know very well, and she said, put down, put down your bags so you can travel light. And that was a, was a good advice because we had lots of bags and lots of heavy books with us. And there was security and my boyfriend was checked, my partner, but I was not. So I could go. And I wanted to go to the Egyptian hall. And that is this place. And... Um, when I got in, I didn't know where to go, but um, then I saw this statue and my breathing stopped. I was just, I froze. Roland saw this, my boyfriend saw this happening and I just was mesmerized by her. I, I had a profound memory coming up and I thought I knew her. I, once I was very, very close to her. 
and I felt her consciousness. I, f I felt she was alive. So I was standing in front of a very alive statue. And I also felt um, a possessiveness. I felt she's mine. And I also felt this coming back. I felt that she uh, radiated to me, you're mine. And I'm, I have no recollection of a past life or anything. I, I just had this uh, feeling coming to me. And I, I felt a, a consciousness in her. And maybe I worshipped her once, but I worship her now, in, in a way. And, but she was also protective, motherly um, love that I, that I felt. But also that she was not a kind of grief, because of course she's not in Egypt anymore. She's, she's in the British Museum, and, and that was also kind of sad. And I touched, I touched her hand with the ank. I, I had to touch her. But I also feel, felt a bit ashamed because I was, I was crying. I, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't uh, keep the tears away. It just, they were flowing and flowing. And I was a bit ashamed about the other tourists that were, that were there. That 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 I was so emotional but, but because a lot of people were just uh, passing by her taking a picture and and just walking walking along and I thought do don't you see that she's alive and it was a very weird experience for me to to feel that and I I touched her feet I w really wanted to touch her feet and I kind of felt like I was in another reality This is another Sekhmet statue that's in the British Museum, that's in the Enlightenment Room. And, uh, but this is a much softer energy to me anyway. Um, I think everybody ha can have another feeling, but that was my personal experience. And my presentation has objective and subjective uh, information, so you will get all kinds of information. But um, when we left the museum, synchronicity started. I saw all kinds of lions everywhere. And of course you see long lead leaves everywhere. But now I, I re really was attracted <laughs> to all these. I saw them everywhere more than normal. And uh, this is uh, an event that we organized last year. And it, the evening was very busy of course you see with all the speakers. And I had no time to think uh, about what really happened with the Sekhmet experience. So um, I was really, this was really busy. You, like you can see uh, at this picture, Miles actually took of me. And um, I just, uh, uh, I was so busy with, uh, with organizing and making sure that everything was okay for everyone and for the speakers that I couldn't think about it. But this uh, picture was shown during our event because Frank Laumann uh, took this picture and this was actually in the field. And the next evening we were talking with uh, some of the volunteers because you cannot do this event alone, you have to help, have help because it's a lot of work. And they uh, pointed out to me that Sekhmet was actually in the field. and. Um, it was announced by a group of hoaxers, this, this, uh, this formation, uh, the clandestine esoterical mysterious universe. It, they said it was placed near an area where there's a lot of testing on animals taking place. Well, and whether it's a hoax or not, to me, it was a synchronicity. So we decided to go to Fixbury Ring and uh, visit this formation. So here I'm lying in the mouth of Sekhmet, trying to, and finally I had time to relive, to relive my, uh, uh, my, my special meeting with Sekhmet again. Here I'm in the nose, and I also went into the eyes, and of course into the sun, but because I will get to that later, but that's, uh, she's the one of the daughters of Ra, and Ra is the sun god. So I was also there, but I didn't 
put it in the presentation. Uh, a few days later, we um, went back to London and uh, to the Atlantis bookshop again. And um, because I I had to get back, I was so I was so mesmerized by what I what I experienced that I thought, w would it happen again when I when I go back? And then when we got to the museum, there was there were so many uh, much much more tourists around that they had put up secu security tents, and uh, I was my heart just sank in my shoes with the idea that I could not see Sekhmet. But then a guard shouted, when you go to the back of the museum, you can get in because there's no security tent there. So that's of course what we did. And then I, w I was with her again and the tears came again. And she was, when I was walking around uh, in the museum, I, I was constantly aware of her. She was pulling me to her, so I, I, to, towards her. So I had to really go back to her, and I was with her for for a long, for half an hour or something like that. My boyfriend took a picture with with um, the four segments, and it said, "Please do not touch." But that was not with the big statue. There was no sign like that, and. If I had seen it before, maybe I, I wouldn't have touched her because, but I saw that it was uh, with the other segment. So I thought, well, okay, well, it happened. I did it. And then we had to go home because our, uh, the, the holiday ended. And, but the synchronicities kept on going because this appeared on Roland's Facebook uh, page on the 7th of August. A lion, somebody put it there. And this was on the 8th of August, which also today is the 8th of August. And it's all about Lionsgate opening. It's all about abundance. And synchronicities kept on going because all uh, I, I took a lot of brochures from, Holland, from, Hol uh, from Britain to Holland and um, uh, all kinds of lines I saw, uh, uh, and this is just a compilation of it, I saw several uh, in every magazine I opened, there was a lion. So I decided I needed to study Sekhmet because I didn't know anything about it. And, and I was wondering if other people had, had, had the same experience I had. So, I started, of course, uh, first looking at um, books about Egyptology, Egyptology, and um, of course Jung said, um, "What's an archetype?" Because she is an archetype. An archetype is a mental image inherited from the earliest human ancestors and supposed to be present in the collective consciousness. Well, okay, that's what an archetype is. But what is segment? What what's more? What, what, what does she stand for? I needed to know more. So I found out she is one of the oldest goddess called the Eye of Ra, the solar god. And she's depicted as a woman with the head of a lioness and the solar disc on top of her head. And there's also this Uraeus snake, the cobra snake, that is ready to attack, but it's also a symbol for strength. But most important, they the... She is less studied and the most uh, puzzling uh, goddess of Egypt that's, that, that exists. And her name is from the old Egyptian word Sekem and that means the powerful one. But she is also connect she's the consort of Ptah, so she's connected to Ptah. And she's the mother of their son Nefertum. She's also connected to uh, Hathor the mother goddess. And she's connected to Bastet, who is also a daughter of Ra. But a soft, much softer energy. This is the place where she was worshipped in Memphis. That was her place where she was worshipped together with her husband and her son, the Holy Trinity of Memphis. She's older than time itself, 
I found out in the books. She was the one that was before the gods were. And she always protects the good and destroys evil. And this is her hieroglyph. But another aspect I found out about Sekhmet, that is that she could avert plagues and diseases. She was the head of very capable priests who were called the Uhab and they had extensive knowledge of the heart and circulation. So she was also called the Lady of Life and the Great Healer. This is Amenhotep III who was really obsessed by Sekhmet. He is the father of Akhenaten and of Nefertiti. And um, Egypt Egyptologists say that he had more than 730 statues made of Sekhmet in his temple. And he put it in, in, his te in the temple of Mut, south of the great temple of Amun in Karnak and on the south bank. But also in his mortuary temple at the west bank of the Nile. And um, he had a reign of 38 years and this was a period of prosperity and peace. And here uh, you can see at the bottom, left bottom, that uh, his, uh, when he lived, it was about 1400 BC. But in fact, Egyptology is only 150 years old. We really don't know that much about, um, uh, the, about the dynasties like that, because um, it was... Um, and our framework for ancient his history is still based on uh, Manitho's king's list and the pharaohs themselves were very mesmerized and, and intrigued uh, with their own history and they had to do research if they made a statue and that is also so we believe all these things that are in the books about Egyptology but in fact we, we, we don't know uh, a lot. We miss a lot. We don't understand how the pyramids are built, but we don't know how they made, how they were able to make that many um, uh, statues, because there was no mold used. None. They were all different. And how can you um, handle uh, a granite and diorite if you ha if you have no tools? to make that so it's all it's all a big riddle how how they made it in that time and it's also it's we we think and we accept that they were made then but maybe they were made much earlier or from in another way in a totally different way this is um, you see on this picture Karnak and Luxor that's the place and the south bank and the west bank where they all the statues uh, are found and were found and they were found like this they were neglected they nobody looked at them so that was years ago now it's a bit better because they were they are now more taken care of and here you see a very beautiful one which is damaged but still is very beautiful and um, they had uh, a sitting and a standing statues, so they they had sittings. Um, uh, they had them for uh, um, to to for for balance. So they needed the statues in uh, 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 sunset and sunrise because um, they were uh, kind of afraid of her. So they wanted to her protection during these. Uh, times of unbalance. Here you see uh, the four statues that are in the British Museum and you see that uh, the sitting ones are holding the ank and that's of course a symbol of life and the standing ones are also holding a scepter and that's uh, standing for strength and power. Here you see uh, Sekhmet in front of the Cairo Museum and you see the cats are attracted to her. This is um, uh, um, Sekhmet in Vienna and uh, 
she has um, not all the segments, I, like I said, they are all different and these ones have uh, um, the mains, are, uh, the, the wig is going just up, uh, uh, they, they stop at the breasts and these breasts have rosettes on them. But that's very special because that's, uh, uh, there are only a few who have that. This is um, Sekhmet in the Louvre, in Paris. These are Sekhmet statues in the Metropolitan in New York. This is also the Metropolitan. This is in the Vatican. And this is very special because this, the Vatican owns 50 statues of Sekhmet. And this is the, is, um, uh, 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 the place where the tourist can visit and uh, it's open. And you can see some statues there of Sekhmet. But there, what's more interesting, I think, is that there's a secret terrace that's inaccessible for tourists. And there are eight statues of Sekhmet there. And they are uh, one sitting, one standing, one sitting, one standing, eight of them. And they are in a horseshoe shape put there. And that's not a coincidence because at the Temple of Mut, there was a there was a, a, a small lake um, where she was worshipped, and this this lake was also in a horseshoe shape. So they know a lot more than we than they tell us, of course. And um, when I was looking uh, for more pictures, I could not find uh, more pictures of this uh, terrace. But when I was um, uh, searching for things on the internet. Uh, I found out. I found out that uh, the whistleblowers are are telling about the pedophile pedophile network that's uh, coming to the surface and all the child abuse. So I'm not going into that, but it's something that will come out into the open. The British Museum owns 30 statues of Sekhmet, but there are only six ones on display, and there are a lot uh, of them uh, in stock, and. Um, uh, they were taken, of course, in the Victorian age, and they were taken to London, but they weren't appreciated, and they were kicked off the boat, and and uh, there's a rumor that there's a big statue of Sekhmet on the bottom of the Thames. But I only want, I also wanted to find out, find out how how is it possible that these statues are alive, or well, I felt them alive and I found out that I'm not the only one. There, there are a lot more people who, f who feel this. And I found this book in Holland um, and there was said that the ancient Egyptians saw the divine as a force with many names. The divine could be everything and everywhere in the same time. It has no boundaries. And of course magicians believe that if they perform rituals and pronounce the right words in the right order, they can influence reality. It's like the, um, if you put the right size plug that fits in the socket of the universe, something like that. And that, this is a very important book if you're into uh, uh, practical Egyptian magic. It's written by Murray Hope. I will get back to Murray Hope because she's very important for the Sekhmet information. The energy the ancient Egyptians used in their magic was called Heka. And this book is all about that. And they believe that this was the energy the creator used to create the, wor the world. And of course they used spells and rituals. And what they did in the past was every morning at sunrise the priest awoke uh, the god statue in its shrine and they washed it, put ointment on it, dressed it, offered it food and, and drink. And with the food the god could reinforce his ka. And ka of, is of course the life force. And so this offering was not purely symbolic but it was necessary. And with the offerings and some flattery the gods were invoked to take possession of the statue. 
And during my research, I I got back to the the somehow to the Atlantis Bookshop because a previous owner of the Atlantis Bookshop worked for a magazine in the 70s that was called Strange Phenomena. And um, they did research, research on psychic abilities of people. And they brought psychics and mediums to the British Museum and they had never been there. They were led by this uh, four statues that I showed you earlier and they're still there. And uh, the psychics had never been there, like I said. And they would either go into trance or see themselves in ancient Egypt, often standing in front uh, of Sekhmet in a shrine. And some said they communicated with her in, in, in their head. And, and often they received knowledge that they, that they didn't know before. And many of them felt tingling sensations when they touched the, the statues. But all of them reported some degree of altered state of consciousness. But I found uh, out that a lot since about 20 years, a lot of books are written, spiritual books, about Sekhmet. A lot of women, uh, also some men, but mostly women, are attracted to uh, Sekhmet. And this is a really good book. Um, and the writers are practicing pagans. And these are the writers with the same Sekhmet statue that I had this experience with. And they had their own special experience with this Sekhmet statue. This book is uh, from America. And these, uh, the writers of this book um, uh, are actually priestesses. They raised a temple especially for, for Sekhmet. And you can find um, a lot of uh, information there to ma of making contact with Sekhmet. And Sekhmet is, is um, women who need extra strength uh, are attracted to Sekhmet. So Sekhmet gives this strength and, and puts you in your power. This is a, a fairly older book. It's from 2002. And Robert Master said, uh, to chaos she brings terror, not in a destructive way, but in a transformatory way. And this book, I just, I just have it with me because I ordered it, it just came out in June, um, and it gives a lot of information also about the Kundalini energy that's connected to Sekhmet, because the, the snake you see on the head is also the Kundalini snake that raises from the bottom chakra to the crown chakra and uh, can get you enlightened, but it's also connected to life energy and even sexual energy, and that why that's why she was also called the Lady of the Flame. And she comes in times of chaos. And if you actually do the work, if you let Sekhmet devour you, digest you, heal you, change you, that's when the magic really happens. This is a book I read about 10 years ago. Um, and um, it's from Patricia Corey. And she has a whole chapter about uh, Hakim, and Hakim is uh, one of the was one of the last indigenous wisdom keepers. He died in two thousand and eight, but there's a whole chapter about him, and I will come back to him. But there's another chapter that's called Initiation by Fire, and it's all about Sekhmet, the activator of the power chakra of the solar plexus. And this is a temple in Karnak. They say that this is the only alive statue in Egypt. And you see in the ceiling there's this, this hole. And you, there's a certain point during the day that the sun uh, uh, comes down uh, exactly on her eyes. And then she radiates. Um, there, I show you. Then all kinds of uh, energy outbursts happen. And people who are around her then feel that the, this temple will get electric. It, it, will, it will just be so powerful and people um, fall to their knees and they get, get into tears. So they cry, they sob because they, they, feel, they feel the energy. 
that and and it's things they've lost but it's still there and it's coming again this is also um, a picture where you see energy going around and she really is initiation by fire by fire she imprints your dna with her her vital life force and now i will show you some orbs flying around uh, uh, Sekhmet in this temple uh, that's two minutes fit footage um, and it's very impressive So I two times I felt this energy and then the holiday ended and we had to go home and then um, I was I was really uh, uh, missing the white spring and the white spring water and I was missing Sekhmet and I felt like she was calling me back so we decided in October last year to go back uh, for three days to go to Glastonbury and we were there in eight and a half hours, which we never uh, 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 could have done before. It was just one big flow, this, this whole trip. And of course, I went to the White Spring and I got my water. But because of the drought, there was only this tiny stream, uh, like you, you see there, um, because the, the White Spring water comes from very high of the tour. Uh, so it took a while to fill all the bottles with, uh, with the water. And inside the white spring you have uh, three shrines. One for the Lady of Avalon, one for the King of the Fairies or the Lord of the Wildwood, and one for Bridget, the Celtic fire goddess. And somehow I, I never got the chance to sit in this area from uh, where the Celtic... Uh, where the shrine is from the Celtic uh, fire goddess but I felt a connection because I hope you can see that this is a lady that is uh, having fire coming out of her hands and when I sat there I suddenly felt a connection with Sekhmet and I uh, it came to me that I wanted to put a stone I wanted to put something there for Sekhmet but I couldn't do that in the museum, of course, so I put it there and I, I just thought I will think of her and she will, she will feel it. And then I, I walked uh, through uh, the, the uh, White Spring and I, I saw this card, which was another synchronicity. But because this is all about uh, the lion and strength and um, uh, number eight again. But I was in Glastonbury and of course I was looking for books or statues or something 
of Sekhmet. I couldn't find anything, but somebody gave me a free magazine. That was an older magazine. And where, where you see the, the, this article is from Judy Hall. You might know her from the Crystal Bible and 40 other books. And it says over there that she has been to Egypt and there was this a connection she felt with Sekhmet and she wrote a book and that's called Torn Clouds which of course I ordered because I was curious and this um, is is a very nice book to read it's a combination of past regressions but also real memories and that all turned into a kind of fiction but it's really nice and when you when you um, read it you will read that um, the character is dream of, dreaming of burning eyes of a lioness who is ordering her, calling to her across time, you are mine, come. And I recognized the possessiveness. And the novel starts like this. Tell me exactly why you pour beer over the lion goddess head. It's not a sight you see often in a British museum. And I found this very funny. And it's, it's a real nice book. And... One thing that I, um, um, you, uh, you saw the earlier footage about her myth, uh, but what's connected also to uh, Sekhmet is that they, in the myth, they put um, uh, uh, pomegranate juice in it, in the beer, so it turned red, and then she thought it was, and it's a myth, and she thought it was human blood, and then she got so drunk, like you saw, that she forgot to uh, destroy uh, humankind and then she changed and she and her healing powers came. But when we were in London, um, I found out before that uh, at Sotheby's, the auction uh, house in New Bond Street, uh, that there's a bust of Sekhmet above the door. And this Dutch uh, was a Dutch guard, he told us that um, this bust was actually sold in 1840 for 40 pounds, but it was never collected. So Sotheby decided to put it above the door. And here you see a more up-close picture of it. And this year in the States, a Sekhmet statue will be auctioned for two or three million, but that's a big statue. So now we were back at the museum and there were um, security tents on the front and back entrance. But a guard said, you, you can get through. So it felt like I was able to get to Sekhmet in time and she, she w really wanted me there and I was not patient. So I was really glad that I could, that I could get to her so fast. And there I was again looking in her eyes, feeling her energy, feeling the tears. And I, I really touched her everywhere. So I, I just thought, I will do this, I need it. I just, I just feel so much, so much love for her. I'm really in love with this statue, with her energy. So I, 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 I touched everything. I felt the, the, the damaged parts and the, the, this color, the other colors. And um, what, I also, what also happened was really weird that my watch stopped for half an hour. I was with her, I think about half an hour, almost closing time. And when I left the museum, my watch started to work again, but running half an hour late. So this energy is incredible. These are some pictures of the time that I could spend with her alone. It's so powerful. And she's larger than life. They're so big. They're, they're eight feet, nine feet tall. What we also did during this uh, very short trip that we took, we, we walked along the embankment because, because I wrote, I read that there are uh, several, well, 
hundreds of lions in this area that you can find. So that was one reason to go there. Another reason uh, uh, was that the unfortunate uh, also was very aware of the west, of the east and south banks of the of of the Nile, and there is a part of the Thames where you also have this um, uh, south and west bank. And here you see a man following a woman to a temple, and it's all connected to to um, to this Egypt thing. But if you're interested in in magic, if you read this uh, uh, novel, then you get a kind of initiation because that's what the unfortunate did. She could, was not able in her time to to op to tell openly about how magic worked, so she put it in novels. But what you see when you walk the embankment, you see this um, the needle that was placed there. Uh, it was a gift for England in 1819, but it, the high cost of transporting it there was £10,000. So that took a while and in 1878 it was finally placed there. But they also put sphinxes there. But <laughs> the strange thing is that sphinxes are supposed to protect and, and um, look away from the, the thing that they are protecting. But these sphinxes are placed with their face to the needle. So they're looking at the needle. So that's totally wrong. But this is the kind of views you have when you're there. It's very nice. And these are the things that you see when you're looking, when you're walking the embankment. And of course, the famous Trafalgar Square, which also has all the lions. And the Nelson Column. And it's all from the same time period, 1800s. And then the short trip ended. We drove back to Dover and we had to go home. And then I, I thought, well, the synchronicity might stop now. Maybe, maybe it's, it's over now. But half November, a few weeks later, a very good friend of me sent me a text message and she said, you really have to go to Leiden because there's this museum where they have all these uh, uh, Egyptian uh, stuff, but they also ha now have for a, a period, they have two big segments on loan from Turin. So we went there as soon as we, as we could and they were, this was the first one I saw and my, it was, Again, this, this feeling of, 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 of home, of, of recognition, but, and I got chills and tears, but, the, but it was a softer energy than the statue in, for me, actually, in, it was. It was a softer energy than the segment in London. And you see here that it's, it's, it's totally different and there's not that much detail because she doesn't have any whiskers. And I could only touch uh, one foot because she, the way they, they put her there. But then I found, uh, I saw the other, another segment in the same room, very near to each other, much more damaged. Because here you see that the toe is, is, uh, is totally crushed. And But I could touch her. I was so happy to touch her. And to feel this energy and again the force and then I, I made a lot of pictures I had to I had to touch her everywhere and 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 I cannot st stop making pictures of her and then here when I stopped making pictures and just looking at her and making contact with her it it was it's she's looking right into your soul she's giving she's empowering you and when I looked into her eyes, um, I swore I could, I could, the eyes got brighter, they moved, they got intense. And it was, it, she's also alive to me. And here you can see more details. This one has whiskers. And the lecture I gave in Holland and in Glastonbury, people could feel, really feel uh, the energy coming from, from this picture. 
And this is another close up. When we got out of the museum, we had a Sekhmet joke because beer is connected to Sekhmet. And this is what we saw when we come out of the museum. So, Sekhmet is a very old goddess. It's a spiritual authority. She, she's a kind of portal. Ask her to burn all your illusions, mess and clutter. And that's what she will do. She will destroy the old and make place for the new. And she will give you the strength to fight and not flee. She, she's an, she's an, uh, f for women, she gives power to women. And her image is a kind of doorway or portal. And through that portal she can reach the physical world. But we can reach the supernatural. And that I think the personal message to me was live your life to the fullest. That was what I felt that she was telling me maybe. Because I had a massive burnout. And uh, ever since that time I got more sensitive. So... That's why I needed to go, I felt I needed to go to the museum and back to her and also to Leiden. And we also went several times to Leiden. This is Willem Witteveen. He's, he's a researcher uh, from Holland and he has been researching the, the pyramids uh, and uh, especially the Great Pyramids for 25 years or longer. He wrote a book. Uh, in Dutch and now it's been translated into a very very nice book and you find lots of really important information there about the pyramids but he uh, because he's a good friend of me he he uh, contacted he said uh, I you you really need to meet some people uh, in in Egypt because he goes there all the time and he knows everyone he also knows this Hakim and he knows his children so he um, he got a message from uh, um, uh, uh, one of the children of uh, of Hakim, and I want to quote this because I found it so beautiful. So the quote starts: "For me, Sekhmet represents the powerful, protective, and healing love of the mother." I think that these stone statues were imbued with an energy somehow that enables us to look deeply within, to connect with the hidden wounds. And maybe to re she reminds us that we have the inner strength to destroy them so that we can be healed and begin a new cycle in our own lives. I will also say that many of us have seen her awaken. Her eyes become, hum become human and emit an energy that is unmistakable. End of quote. And... Uh, the eldest daughter of Hakim said to uh, Willem, I'm sure your friend Nancy has Egyptian ancestors of past life in here. That, that, were, that were her words. I have no recollection. I, don't, I didn't do any past life regression, but that was what she said. This is the book again. This is Hakim. He was the indigenous wisdom keeper. He was able to, to, um, uh, to, make, to um, syn synchronize left and right brains with, with, for people. And they could actually uh, see Egypt for centuries ago and feel the energy and see how different it was then. And when you're not able to travel to Egypt, or you're not able to go to a museum. That that's doesn't does that's that's okay because you can contact uh, Sekhmet also with little statues or meditation or visualization or use her hieroglyph. And red is her color. So I made this altar because I gave a lecture in Holland, and um, I thought I I will do I will put everything on the table I can find that's connected to. Sekhmet. So the pomegranate is there. Uh, um, spicy food is her thing, like ginger cookies. Mold wine uh, and tortilla uh, chips. And um, this is the uh, small church in which I, I gave the lecture, uh, a two-hour lecture. 
and I also did a guided meditation uh, for people because I really I really wanted to try to uh, let the people feel the energy so I I I um, wrote this whole uh, journey uh, that you uh, go you're suddenly walking somewhere and it's very warm you feel the heat and you buy something for Sekhmet and then you go to this Sekhmet temple and you you um, you you bow for her and you you give her this this gift and then um, you you wait and you just um, you feel the energy and she will give you something and the thing is that it's uh, I was wondering if it would work if 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 people would feel it and afterwards people came to me and they said I actually got a gift from her and I was so happy that I was able to 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 give people this energy because it's it's there were all people there that were really into Sekhmet so they came from all parts of Holland from very far away because they had maybe had an experience 20 years ago in Karnak or whatever but really important and what happened at the end of my lecture was that people came up to me and said have you ever heard about the lion people and I said yes yes I have heard about it I think I I've held a book in my hands once three years ago in the inner bookshop in Oxford which sadly isn't there anymore which was a great bookshop and this was a book by Murray Hope and it was about the lion being beings but because it was channeled information that was my impression I, I, I didn't know what to do with it so I left it there but these people was, were uh, they were asking me and I just said I, I know that there may be advanced beings um, from 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 another planet from from somewhere else but that's all I know but it, it kept on going in my head and I thought I have to research this also so I found this book by Stephen Mailer, and he knew Murray Hope and they both also knew Hakim and there are a lot of quotes of Hakim in this book um, Hakim had degrees, held degrees from Cairo University in archaeology and Egyptology but, but he also is the indigenous wisdom keeper and his children now inherited his knowledge and he was talking um, about Ptah and Mailer was very interested in um, the, the Egyptian word for Sirius written by the Egyptologist as SPDT and Hakim said that it was wrong and it, it should have been Sa Ptah, the birthplace of Ptah and the Hopi, the Dogons and the ancient Indi Egyptians all believe that Sirius people came, people from Sirius came to earth in, in well, long, long time ago during the periods of destruction of, of Atlant Atlantis and Mu, things like that. But what in fact Hakim said was that Ta was from the Sirius star system, he who comes from the blue. And here you see uh, the blue on his head and of course the connection with Sekhmet with, with also the blue there. Another book I found um, during my research also from Stephen Mailer and that is also with a lot of quotes from Hakim and he explains in there about that there was no first time for the old Egyptians it was it was all about cycles cycles of times and he was talking about the primary time the prime time of consciousness when the, the gods with which they called the natures they walked the earth and there was no need for priests because everyone knew the gods inside out and this 
The left book was the book I left in, in Oxford. But I ordered it again because now I really wanted to read it. And her line being connection is telepathic. She, she doesn't, she's not alive anymore. But this is channeled information combined with memories. And she said they stand erect on two legs and are taller than we. They are creative yet practical, well-grounded race, strong physically and orderly with humor and they are cuddly, cuddly. And she could visualize their appearance and she said maybe because they were here the people uh, saw her and this this knowledge was used later to make all the statues and she said um, now they have evolved and they are pure energy they they don't have bodies anymore but and according to murray hope they, ha they had two main visitations and the first was when one of their spaceships broke down and they had to, had to land on our planet and the second time was when a group of lion beings were monitoring the effects of the shifting of the poles. And this is a drawing of someone. Um, this is what they might have looked like when they were here. But I found more channelings and more uh, regressions that confirm, that confirm what Murray wrote. And on their home planet there were no wars, no sickness, no disease, no greed or perversion. And they just wanted to share, share this with us. And they wanted to protect us and they wanted to help us in times of chaos. And now we're in a time of chaos. And I found another um, uh, book. Uh, where there was a, a physical encounter described with lion being uh, people in ancient Egypt and this was recalled through spiritual sessions and I need to quote this because it's so beautiful. So I quote, when these giant lion beings from Sirius opened their arms to us starseeds, we all fell into them and almost melted. We petted, we cried, we attached ourselves ourselves to each of them. I wrapped my arms around the male elder and buried my face in his fur and never wanted to let go. They emitted nothing but the purest and highest love I'd ever experienced and it was intoxicating being within their presence. After about a half hour we had to let the elder lion beings leave. We wept like little children. We thought we wouldn't emotionally survive them leaving earth after falling in love so deeply with them but they had to get back home and so the meeting ended far too soon for all of us end of quote but Murray Hope also did research and this is this is more a book of research and she said she said in this book the Sekhmet archetype and the lion theme are slowly merging into the collective unconscious and that has a reason they aim for a kind of maturity that could prove to be the salvation of the planet. This was excavated last year in March. They found, they excavated uh, six big statues and two busts of Sekhmet. But this year, this uh, was in the Egypt independent 66 statues excavated at the funerary temple of Amenhotep III but now because of Willem Witteveen who got me into in touch with several people in Egypt I have a source that said this is not all it's not it will not be public it will not be in the papers but it's more than a hundred and, and I've seen things, I've seen pictures I cannot share. I've had information. I was very lucky because this source is very reliable. But you here you see one of the statues. And here you see it looks very small, but it's actually, they're very big. What also 
uh, was told me to me and here you see the proof and you can find uh, uh, footage on YouTube they had a SECMED omnipresent conference in March it was kept secret it was four days all about SECMED and the Minister of Antiquities the director of the Egyptian Museum Egyptologists and archaeologists they were all there and there were there were all kinds of, of information shared also um, uh, someone from the Vatican who told a lot and you can find a lot on, on, on YouTube like I said so it's the thoughts and the deeds of the people on earth that decide whether the poles will shift or not and if we go how this 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 time of chaos will develop and she will help in times of cha of chaos but our planet is destined for a golden age and in my opinion that is the reason that so many people now are inspired to write the spirit these spiritual books about Sekhmet and that is the reason that she is um, that so many statues are coming to the surface so in my opinion I think Sekhmet is here and she's coming back the force is growing it's coming back it's getting bigger she's here to lead us into this golden age and this is my last slide if you feel a connection to Sekhmet this might be a journey you want to go to because um, we will visit uh, uh, Cairo and Luxor we will go to a lot of Sekhmet statues not only Sekhmet statues but a lot and I will give a two hour um, uh, lecture there also so this is a trip for those who are holding Goddess Sekhmet in their hearts well, hello and welcome to the Basis Q&E about a great Egyptian goddess. Not the beautiful Nancy Pollitt. Is that correct? Yes. I've always called you Pollet. <laughs> uh, I forgive you. So we've you. got Nancy here. <laughs> and uh, welcome to the Basis Project. And we've just done a very important presentation. And I'm hot cutting this so we can deal with things. So Nancy, uh, you have been very taken by a goddess called who Sept. Sekhmet. Sekt. Sekhmet. The Sekt. Egyptian goddess Sekhmet. Which, and it means the powerful one. Oh, so I better not... Better not mess with her this time. Okay. So what does this mean in terms of um, the goddesses and, and things? Because you've come up with some very... You've come up with some very, very important elements here which are seem to be suppressed... Yes. And a lot of it's focused on um, the English, the British Museum here and dumping of statues and things. I mean, this is an incredible cover up. Well, well, but also mm -hmm. uh, the kind of interviews which uh, Jane Shattuck was with us at the conference last week or so um, at the Bases Conference. And she was referring to how different animals would em evolve in the different species uh, eventually becoming human and so forth so the the cat species and the mouse species and all e evolution upwards um, indicates that we have got a great affinity with these beings these cat people or tiger people lion type people and this is instrumental in some of the stuff that some of the other individuals have been talking about so what do you think really happened when you were sort of taken with the statue is it still active yes it's active um what i was just thinking about the cats that you said the the, the cats that that are now on on our planet are a kind of they are still in touch with the lion being so they they help us they are tuned into so that there's a connection the the cats i mean i have a giant pussy cat which is carved to six foot it's almost two meters uh, and it's made of teak and it has a wonderful happiness to it, it's like a draw to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I um, actually, uh, I, I don't know why I, I, um, I, 
I just bought this thing. It's just like a massive teak pussy cat. Really? With big ears and big eyes and flowing hemp hair. Right, right, and just, it just immediately caught my eye and I bought it. Fastest purchase I've ever done. 500 quid, a lot of oh. money. And that's about seven or eight years ago. Okay. Uh, probably half a rainforest. So uh, what, what do you think is, why have you been drawn into this? Well, for me personally, because, because I need to get into my strength. And that's not only me, of course. We need women to get, we need the, the, the women power back. We need, the, we need a different society. We need uh, a different world. And the, the male uh, thing that is the politics and the banks and all the things, mostly male. And the, the, the women energy has to come back. This divine element, this divine connection with source, I think you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, um, well the, what the th what's happening with, with a lot of women who are attracted to Sekhmet at the moment uh, c could be that they need uh, a certain power, that they, that they don't, that they're not um, using their strength. And women are very, very, they are so strong and they need to be aware of that. And Sekhmet is, is giving you this power. But it's, but it's not only for women, but, but a lot of women are attracted to it, to her. And a lot of women go through this transformation. Like this book I sh just showed you, the transformation in the belly of the goddess. So you can, you can get rid of all the, she will destroy the things that you don't need anymore. And so there's place for new things, for better energy. But that works globe. That works for the whole world. So if people, if more uh, women get attracted, and more books are written about, and more is told about Sekhmet, and that's why this trip is important. And that's the reason that I feel I I need to give these lectures. It has nothing to do with me. It's for Sekhmet. Okay, it's for right. the power. Continuing on. Mm -hmm. uh, about your involvement with this goddess. What brought you to this? What does it mean to you? Well, like I said, um, I'm fairly new to it. So only last year I felt I needed to be at the museum. I didn't know why, but when I was in the museum, I saw Sekhmet and this, this profound memory surfaced. How did you get connected with this? What does it mean for you? For me? Yeah. For me personally? Yes. I need to get into my strength and she will help. She gets women into their strength. She, she empowers women, but not only women, because only also men are attracted. Also men are hugging her and feeling all this power coming from her. And that's personally, but that's also subjective. But there are objective, objective things also going on because this energy is coming to the surface she's getting bigger and bigger and she used to be very big in the past and they were afraid of her but she is not she's loving there's nothing to be afraid of she will only destroy what needs to be destroyed and she will help you but this is a, a trans a transformation process Happiness and fun is important, but strength is also very important. And we need it because we need an, a different world. We need a different world because it's chaos. And like I said, Sekhmet comes when there's chaos and she will help. She will help clear this chaos and bring a better world. So it's not for me just, it's not about me. I'm only trying, I'm only... Uh, the messenger <laughs> I'm only helping and I feel I need to uh, well she she gave me this strength and I I want to help I want to spread this knowledge that's 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 my job what other aspects of why so much of it has been kept back in the British Museum I mean uh, what what is it why is it stuck in the English, what's the connection here? You mentioned lots of statues that have been dumped. Then maybe the biggest one was sitting in the Thames somewhere. They, they kicked it off the boat. 
And what sort of size are we talking about here? There are different sizes, but I, I think the one that, uh, that's in the British Museum, the one that, I, that I, I had the experience with, is one of the biggest. So it's nine feet tall. And she's sitting down. Imagine her standing up. Wow, yeah, I can see that. This has been giving you an empowerment for how many years now? No, very short, just last year. And I'm going through this process because it's it's not something that is, uh, it's not that you have one experience and then uh, you're suddenly uh, not sick anymore or suddenly in your strength. You, It's a transformation process. So it takes time. And for me personally, it, it will take some time, but I will get back, I will get back into my strength. And I'm just, um, when, I'm, when I'm doing the work for her, I feel her force all the time. So it helps, it helps, it makes me happy. It makes me feel like life is, is beautiful. And when you're near her, you feel another reality. You feel the, 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 rea the, the world that we could have if, if it, if we if we just approach it on a different way if in a different even a different way when things are changing and things are changing there are a lot of things changing but of course it's kept out of the news that's not on the on the television they want to keep the fear uh, they want to they want to keep people in fear so they 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 go only do their job and they think i need my money i need everything i, I cannot change anything but they can because it will be different. And she is one of the, she's not the only one, the only force, but she's, she may be one of the forces that will get us into this golden age that we, that we, they, we that, that we have the promise that we are allowed. We, we, we are, we are meant to be in this golden age and she will lead us there. She will help. And everything I can do to make this bigger, I will work for that. You're talking about light workers, yes, and the essence of what that means to yes. people. Explain more. Well, I'm aware for many years that you are you are a light worker. I'm a light worker. We're, we're there are lots of light workers around, and our task is to bring this new energy into the world. To act, to act as portals, just to, 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 to change the world, to make it better, to, to get, get us back into the strength that we, that we have, that we had in the past, and they took it from us. And who, who are they? Who, are, who is the problem here? Well, I don't want to go uh, into that too deep into that but I've read that when the lion beings were here there were 5% uh, of the reptilians were were here and were destroying everything they had a, a kind of war with them and part of them went underground and there but of course uh, I I never saw a re I, I, I'm not um, I never saw that. I cannot prove that. I, it's not the David Icke stuff that I that I wanna. I wanna concentrate on the good stuff, and the the positive things, and that's what I see, and that's what makes me happy, and it makes a lot of people happy, because after my lectures, a lot of people came up to me thanking me for 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 this information now this is something that you did at uh, at, at the glastonbury symposium yes uh, and in, uh, in july of 2017 yes so this was your first major presentation on no this, i also did it in holland okay. in december because i study very very fast but in december in holland i didn't talk about the lion beings because i learn from the audience because they come up to me and they give me all kinds of new information which leads me again to to extra uh, research and I do the research and I connect the dots and that's why um, uh, these ladies wanted me to give the lecture uh, during their trip 
So, and there, there will be uh, not only the people uh, of um, they, that will attend the, the trip, but only also, but also Egyptian people. So it will be in in, in Cairo. I will give this lecture of two hours, um, and and then there will be also Egyptian people there because some people who live near the pyramids are not aware of certain things. So, so. Not every everybody that lives in Egypt is is aware of of the power of Sekhmet. And as long as I can help, just spreading this, I'm happy. Well, obviously, a lot of people were aware of this, and why why has this been suppressed? I mean, those statues and virtually you know, you've dumped out. Not not. I mean, why are some sets of statues important? And we are focused on them, yet this one seems to be so important, yet, yeah. as you described in, in your presentation, yes. just left there in the, in the desert. Yeah, but because I have uh, maybe a lot more research to, done, to, to do, but uh, the, the question is, of course, uh, if this pharaoh, Amenhotep, who, uh, who they say made all the uh, statues or... Uh, made sure that they were there what did he know uh, this this maybe he didn't know anything he just had something he wanted protection and he um, made sure that there were several uh, uh, statues there but then it got lost it, it just we just lose you just lost the knowledge because the knowledge is from much further back it's 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 what do you what what would you call ancient Egypt yeah. Atlantis yeah. these kind of periods then we had the knowledge we had the connection we 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 knew them and we know them because that's what happened to me when I saw the statue I remembered a part and that's what happens to people when they go to Karnak or when they go to a museum and see these statues. They remember because it's, it's in your DNA. It is in your brain. It is somewhere. But it has to be triggered. Well, I've got an affinity with this because of a connection with Ireland and Egypt. And there's a tremendous connection with that. And that will be a feature of the BASIS conference in September 2017. Ireland awakens, but uh, let's not just so close to the immediate future. Finally, where do you think this is leading? And I mean, you saw this crop circle thing. So I mean, that was an amazing. There was connection there. I mean, that was phenomenal. And that again, well, it was, was a synchronicity yeah, yeah. for me. But but uh, I don't know. It it, it it was a hoax, I think. But but I I don't care. Because the, the, the thing well, is, the hoax, hoax is, formation... Well, difference. It's the intuition put into the human that makes the Yes, hoax. that's true. And that's why hoaxes are, are part of the phenomenon. Because the people who are, who are making these crop circles are also inspired, are also led to do something. So they, maybe they put it there because of the animal abuse that, was, that, is, taking, that is happening there. But to me, it was a synchronicity. And I was very happy in this formation. Yeah, well, the, the point is, even if it's humans and they choose, well, it, how they're made is irrelevant, really. The fact it's the inspiration that the design has and why choose that particular, uh, yeah. th that person or whoever created that must have had a knowledge of that, of what well, you're talking about. I think, yeah, I think they, they must have had a knowledge of the power of Sekhmet, of the power of Sekhmet, because the, because the the abuse of the of the of the animals in that area maybe they wanted to give uh, uh, power to these animals to help them in some way because i think the way we treat animals on this planet is horrible and is just awful so well we're treated as bad by whatever the predator is I mean, yeah. there's something treating our children and things but that's another you did mention that you did mention the child abuse thing. Uh, yes. Uh, that is, that's a horrendous thing. And the connection, you made a very strong connection with the Vatican on that. Yes. Where um, do you think that's leading us? Well, I think the first thing that needs to be ha the happening is that it comes out in the open. So we need the whistleblowers. We need the people to tell. We, and more people and more people will tell about the horrible things that are happening. And, and that's, that's the part that we need to get rid of. 
And we will, because we are stronger. We, we, we are stronger as the, the, the good humans, the, 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 the light workers, the people that, that are here and are, are really, are really um, uh, they, need, they feel they have the strength and they need to use that strength. But um, work needs to be done. We need to get rid of, the, of all the evil. But the evil needs to be out in the open. So if you look at it and if it's out in the open, it will, it will eventually uh, not happen anymore. Because, but now people, of course, in the Vatican, I don't know what, what, what happens, but it also happens in Holland. It happens in a lot of places. Ireland, it happens here. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's incredible that, that's, that it's possible. It needs, everything will, will come. This is the time when all these this negative things will come out. And the thing is, uh, we don't need extra fear. We just need to be aware of it. And knowledge protects, yeah. I think. Yeah. So well, we, can, we can look at it. We can look at all the evil things and and then it will change because then we 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 go we don't give it energy or we don't fear it we don't are in fear anymore because it it will not it will not last well i have to say nancy that's exactly what this basis thing is all about oh. that's what that logo is behind us to stop the transhumanization issues and the terrible things going on there yes and the logo well anyway but that's what the logo says people keep asking me about the logos uh, okay well thank you very much indeed thank you is there any final thoughts you want to give us before we um, close up this unique basis on your wonderful presentation well i i hope a lot of people will look at the um the website and i hope they that more people will feel what's happening and want to and they hope I, they, they want to be there they want to feel it and if you feel this you will be changed forever you will not f will uh, uh, you will not step into the, the fear anymore of what they show you on the television or in the papers and you 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 will see through it and you will see that it's a big game and we eventually will will win the the good will win excellent well thank you and finally you. what is that website do you have it on you yes it's www to speak up a bit darling ah, www.skyhighcreations.nl that's the netherlands that's yeah because they the lady so that explains your slightly dodgy english accent then there thank you <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the the lady the ladies who uh, organized this trip they didn't have a website so we offered our website uh, so people can look there and see the whole program see where we're going and see the costs and see what's included and what's not included so that's basically why. the tour uh, just to round this off we've already done a little promo on it but essentially probably hopefully we'll be able to do some more in the future and uh, hopefully that'll work out and thank you very much thank on you the Miles. 8th of august 2017 that's 8 8 an incredible synchronicity yeah. okay thank you thank you